case like this, nobody just walks into the office and tells you who the killer is. It just doesn't happen that way. Frailty is a horror thriller released in 2002, directed by Bill Paxton and written by Brent Hanley. It stars Bill Paxton, Matthew McConaughey, and Powers Booth. It tells the story of a father and his two sons who are maybe called by God to vanquish demons. Has God spoken to me and my guest? Find out on this episode of I Love This Movie. And welcome back to the channel, Mr. Michael Donovan Horn. Last time you were here, we talked about Split Second. Yep. <laughs> and I reached out to you about uh, doing another one of these for Halloween season. And I sent you a couple films and one of them was Frailty. And you're like, yes, let's oh, yeah. do that one. <laughs> yeah, you, have, it, the, you can't talk about Frailty enough because it's, mm -mm. it is literally a hidden gem. I mean, and like, I, ever since I first saw it, like, I just, people are like, hey, you need a good horror movie. I was like, have you seen Frailty? Right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 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 Go find it. Watch it. Cause it's <laughs> yeah, I, I first saw this when it came out on video, I believe. And I remember seeing an interview with Bill Paxton. I think he was either on Conan O'Brien or I think, it, actually, I think it was The Tonight Show. He was on there promoting the film and he was talking about it and, you know, how he wanted it to be kind of an old school, you know, horror thriller type thing. Right. And he talked about the trailer because I watched the trailer uh, a couple hours ago and it's very early 2000s with like the stabby lettering with the whoosh oh, yeah. noises and the, the very dramatic voiceover. Nothing that crazy could be real. The angel told me that God would be sending weapons. Maybe you just dreamed it. Maybe you're not right in the head. And um, he was talking that he wanted to do a trailer that was like a produced trailer. And I miss those. I miss oh, produced trailer. Great. Why, did they, why did they stop? Doing I don't know. That? I mean, they did one for can the most recent Candyman, which was really cool. The, oh. the Shadow Puppets. I really enjoyed oh. that. But he said he wanted to do it where, you know, it's his character in the barn and he's got the Otis axe. And he's like, you want to you want to hear a scary story about an axe? You know, just really go wild with it. That's pretty good. Now make yourself one, Queen. Yeah, totally. I mean, produced trailers are so, they were so great. And they just, mm -hmm. they stop. And because those things are such a great advantage because they're, they're so much fun. Plus they don't give away. Exactly. 80% <laughs> of the movie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> when you see it. <laughs> you know, just... like, like one of my favorite ones was the, uh, the produced trailer they did for Face Off. Oh God, I haven't seen that. <laughs> oh, it's great because it's <laughs> just in like a dark room and there's a shaft of light and uh, mm -hmm. John Travolta is sitting there and he's like, I've been after him for years and he's done everything. And it's, and, you know, the like extortion and murder, and he, you know, is blah, blah. And he's terrible. And, they, and the thing like swings around him as he's talking like this, you know, mm -hmm. he's like, I don't, I don't know what to do, but I think maybe I finally have a plan. And then when the camera's behind him, he's, he's like going, like this over his face you and know it comes around like this and he comes back out of the shadow and he's nicholas cage and ah! he's, and he's, it's still in, in travolta's voice he goes i will become him and then you're like what <laughs> and now after all this time i finally figured out a way to trap him i will become him and then it just literally said face off <laughs> and then you're like what that's all you need that's all yeah. you need that's all yeah. you need yeah some of my favorites are like uh, the Terminator 2 one, where it's just oh, yeah. like the mass producing of the Terminators. Uh, Romancing the Stone had a great one with Danny DeVito. Oh, yeah. Where, yeah, where he's like in the, the dirty, seedy South American uh, like hotel room and he's packing up and just like bitching about having to go back out there. He's like... Now I got to go back to this godforsaken jungle. And then he turns to the camera and he goes, and you're coming with me. <laughs> There's nothing you can say that'll make you go back into that hellhole. Don't bring that up, Ira. Ira, stop it. <laughs> All right, I'll go back. But this time, you're coming with me. It's so, they were so great. It's so great. I've missed yeah, so it. They 
they should have done that for frailty you know instead of, oh man it's all the oh man it's, it's, it's like 2000s horror trailers like a genre in themselves they like, are have you <laughs> have you seen the original trailer for ravenous no yeah. one, no wonder nobody saw that movie yeah, right <laughs> It's terrible. It's got a Rob Zombie song on it. Yeah, I know. Like, it's said <laughs> in colonial times, but we'll put Rob right? Zombie. <laughs> <laughs> That's so annoying. Stu a la Major Knox. Oh my goodness. Oh man. But anyway, yeah. <clears throat> but talking about this movie, um, I watched a couple interviews with Bill Paxton when he was promoting this. And um, he was talking about, you know, how he got started. He, he'd wanted to direct a movie for a while. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he found this script. It was, you know, this amazing script. Um, and so he wasn't even looking for a horror script or anything like that. He's like, I was just looking for a good script. And this one came across my desk. And then um, he got Matthew McConaughey to sign on. I mean, they're both Texas boys. And yeah. so is the writer. And so yeah. is Powers Booth, um, <laughs> who he met um, on set on Tombstone. So that's how he got yeah. hooked up with Powers Booth. And he said, you know, instead of this, this movie, you know, tr no studio wanted to make it. But he went in there he's like, and um, he's like, you know, I'm going to direct it. It's got this great script. Matthew McConaughey is signed on. I've got Powers Booth. And going in with that package instead of just trying to go in and just pitch a movie Lionsgate you know came up with the money for it mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I mean that's that's the way to do it I guess I mean he's got so many connections you know through well, his yeah, acting you, know, you go in with a you know you go on I mean speaking from experience you go in with a script even if it's great mm -hmm. you, know, the, you know they get movie studios get like what like 5,000 scripts a year and they can only say yes what like 12 times yeah <laughs> <laughs> So you have to pick the absolute best, but if mm -hmm. you go in with a great script, it's one thing. You go in with a great script and a big name attached to it saying, yeah. I want to do this, that's an automatic draw for the audience in a, in a, oh, yeah. a, in a certain uh, demographic, which mm -hmm. means you got to tell the studio, we can we can already make money with this as long as we've got this face in it. So oh, yeah. That's, yeah, that's, a, that's a huge plus. Oh, yeah. And <clears throat> the budget was around $10 million, I want to say. I think so. And it grossed a little less than 20. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, for that time, it's not bad for a horror movie. It's not bad, but it's not great either. Yeah. And I was going through some of the other horror and films like this that were released around the time. And it seemed like this was kind of a pocket where horror kind of dipped a little, especially, you know, major studio releases. Yeah, they, and, they started doing, like, they started branching out into kind of like, basically like weirder experimental stuff yeah a lot of japanese remakes yeah and then they were coming off like the late you know the late 90s where they i remember when uh suspect zero came out do you remember that mm -hmm. yeah and that was that was really kind of out there but it, it, yeah. it was it was it was really good i liked it but it had, oh, yeah. a, it had a, a, a um a few things that were a little too out there for the audience mm -hmm. you know but you're like yeah but they tried something new Oh and yeah. Going from coming out of the, the 90s into the 2000s it seems like they were starting to branch out and try a bunch of new stuff. Oh yeah, definitely. And I mean this was right around the time uh, I always <clears throat> especially since they came out around the same time and they have kind of the same sensibilities as Fallen with yeah. Denzel Washington, yeah. which is another great horror movie that didn't do well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, I, I think around this time horror was starting to lean more and go more down the road of pg-13 instead of r-rated horror yeah yeah because in the in the you know the early 90s the spec boom happened you know because hollywood was literally like we need more ideas yeah and they literally started buying like everything that came their way <laughs> people were selling, <laughs> selling screenplays for like five hundred grand a pop oh my never written anything before just so they could have new material to play mm -hmm. around with. and then towards the end of the 90s that started to of course started to peter out because oh, they yeah. were like, oh we made a lot of good stuff but we also made a lot of shit a lot of shit <laughs> <laughs> they started to yeah they started to of course go back to their more of narrowing down of the best stuff we can get and then oh, yeah they would get 
really good scripts and then they would they would try and um a lot of directors and whatnot would try to do something more like more interesting with it more experimental to break out of the stuff that everybody was used to in the 90s oh yeah and i Paxton said that he had pretty much creative control over the entire process, except yeah. even though they have, you know, a Texas writer and Bill Paxton and Matthew McConaughey and Powers Booth, all these Texas connections, it wasn't filmed in Texas. <laughs> it was filmed in Hollywood, California. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was the one, that was, Texas. Oh, yeah. He said that's the one thing he didn't have control over. They said, you can shoot it in Hollywood or you can shoot it in Vancouver. And he's like, uh, I always, you know, if I'm going to choose my first production, it's going to be in Hollywood is where I'm going right. to do it. Imagine like, if they would have filmed it in Texas. I know. <laughs> how much, I mean, it, 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 it looks great. I love it. It does. The cinematography would imagine how much better it could have been if they had actually like taken advantage of the actual location where the whole thing. Those, those barren Texas landscapes and yeah. Texas skies. Yeah. But yeah, but still, I mean, it's it still comes across incredibly eerie. Yes, it does. In a very good way. So they, they definitely pulled it off. Now listen, this may sound a little bit crazy, but I know who the God's Hand Killer is. For for those of you that have not seen this, we will be talking spoilers in yeah, this conversation. Uh, so just beware if you haven't seen it. Yeah, we're definitely going to go into the ending. Oh yes. <laughs> It not only has a twist ending, it has like three, three twist endings right on top of each other, and they all make sense. And you're like sitting there shocked at the end of the movie, and, and you just you wonder why it didn't do better at the box office. Like, yeah, it, I don't know the audience's head. It's possible, it's like, or they just didn't market it well. I mean, the trailer wasn't great. Well, of course not. You know, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> early 2000s trailers are seldom great but oh yeah but uh yeah i mean when i i've my wife and i i don't honestly i don't remember like why we ended up watching it for the first time mm -hmm. i think it's maybe because my wife loves matthew mcconaughey and and i'm a i'm a big bill paxton fan oh and yeah so, you know good old aliens and Terminator and whatnot and so when i heard he was directing something and it was that and then of course, I was like, ooh, and then my wife was like, God, hey, I'm in. So Something for I, both of us. Yeah, so <laughs> I, can't remember, I can't remember if we rented it or, or, or we saw it on TV or what, but I remember mm -hmm. both of us just really thoroughly enjoying it. And then I remember when the movie ended in the credits roll, my wife and I just looked at each other like, why has nobody else been talking about this movie? Exactly. Like this- exactly. Like, it was amazing and we were like ah oh. and then literally for like years after that people would be like i need a good horror movie or like have you seen frailty frailty <laughs> yes Watch frailty do it do it now <laughs> go and, and they were like oh and of course we were like what's that like because nobody had heard about nobody. it nobody like, that's such a crime because it's so well done it's so well done and um <clears throat> so let's let's talk about the characters a little bit we've got uh well we have a framing device essentially a little yeah. bit um and i i love when horror has framing devices as long as they're done well you know they're just not in there because they don't know how to do exposition <laughs> yeah right here yep might just be some crack pot but i figured i should call you anyway did he ask for me by name nope uh asked for the agent in charge of the god's hand case okay, said he had some important info on it but right from the beginning this entire story is told to us by matthew mcconaughey because Powers Booth, he's Texas FBI man. He's called into the office late, late at night. He's been working on this uh, serial killer case, the God's Hand Killer, which is a great name. Yeah. Great name for a serial killer. Because in his office is Matthew McConaughey, who says his name is Fenton Meeks and that his brother is the God's Hand Killer. Yeah. <clears throat> and of course, Powers Booth is like, uh, why should I believe you? You could be some fucking crackpot. And so then we start to get the story back in the 70s. Bill Paxton's the dad. Uh, we get the younger version of Matthew McConaughey. We get Fenton and Adam Meeks are the two sons. And I love how they establish the relationship between the three. Because even though the, the mother has passed on, the mother is gone. Uh, Bill Paxton's a widower. 
he is a really good dad mm-hmm. and they show that so well yeah the the he's a hard-working mechanic you know he's and it's great because they show um, the boys at home and uh, Fenton is making dinner mm-hmm. for everybody. So it shows that he's been taught how to do those things by his oh, dad yeah. to take care of his brother and take mm-hmm. care of the family in a sense and things like that. And then Bill Paxton comes home and they sit down and have dinner. And, you know, he goes immediately goes to the sink and washes his hands after working on cars all day. Yep. And Fenton, and while they're eating, Fenton talks about his, his math at school, not being strong and everything like that. And, and uh you know and you, you could i mean bill paxton's character could have done all sorts of things he could have come home and poured a drink and you know yeah. just anything it could have <laughs> because it's it's a great testament to um you know healy the writer mm-hmm. uh, about uh making sure and um and fans having trouble with his math and uh bill paxton's character says well, i didn't care for math either he's like hell i can't do anything without a calculator but then he looks at his son he says tell you what We'll sit down after dinner. We'll work out that junk together. I sure love peas. <laughs> you must. You better be careful, though. You just might turn into one. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, no. and he's just like that's that's a dad. It's so loving. Mm-hmm. And then they go to bed, and he asks him. They brush their teeth, and he goes to Adam and smells them. And then he's like, Whoa! he's and playing the around kids. with them. Yeah, the kids so love it. So great. <laughs> teeth all brushed. You sure about that, Adam? All right, bread test time. Oh, and it's, it's, and um, the best part of that is that it, it shows a great comparison between before. Yes. What happens to the family happens about how normal, not necessarily normal, but how tight they are as a family and how much, how loving they are as a family and how, when the big event happens if you will mm-hmm. how it just completely shift away from completely that completely shatters that whole thing yeah because if if you know the dad was abusive to start with or anything like that then we wouldn't be able to go with him on the journey emotionally because oh, no. he wouldn't be anywhere near as invested oh no and <clears throat> And they're not an overly religious family either. There's not a bunch of crosses everywhere. They don't mm-hmm. pray before they, you know, start eating dinner. Right. So, and and that kind of subtlety, because they could have easily, you know, had all that stuff around the house, you know, and had that lingering in the background. But it makes you question things in your mind even more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he, you know, the... The big event is is that Bill Paxson has an angel, God essentially, come and visit him and tell him that he is a warrior of God. I need you both to listen to me very carefully. Something's happened. He said he'd had a vision that night. A vision from God. And him and his family have been tasked with the 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 holy uh, mission of killing demons Mm -hmm. that are disguised as everyday people yep and it's just out of nowhere you know he kisses them good night they go to bed lights flick off they go right to sleep and then all of a sudden lights are on dad busts in finn wake up dad adam get up i've got something to tell you what's wrong Mm -hmm. and he's spouting all of this shit and these are two young boys trying out of a dead sleep trying to process that (laughs) yeah Yeah, i mean your dad walks in and says i've had a visitation of an angel from god and we have to start destroying demons who look like people and this is our job now yeah you know it's seven years old and you're you're like uh what dad (laughs) you know and and you as the audience is like excuse me right like you know and of course the obvious thing is this guy just lost his mind exactly the angel called us god's hands so we're like superheroes? That's right. Or a family of superheroes are going to help save the world. My dad, that doesn't make any sense. Because you know, cause it, it happened like that. And now you're like, well, what's what the hell is going to happen with this family now? Mm-hmm. Because it's so foreboding 
that you can just feel it in your bones. Like this is, especially when he says destroying demons that look like people. People. And yes. you're like, okay, so we know what this really means. Mm -hmm. But is this really going to happen? Is it really going to go this far? Because you're just so unsettled by it. And it's very masterful. And my favorite part of the whole thing is that when he's telling about his vision, mm -hmm. he and Adam are sitting on the same bed. Yes. And Fenton is alone on his bed. Mm -hmm. And as as Bill Paxson is not um, he continues talking about what the angels tell him and everything the camera does this amazing thing where it just pulls back from Bill Paxton and, and Adam because they are getting further and further like away from Fenton further, further away from Fenton because Adam character is all in with what his dad is saying yes and Fenton is the the older brother, the wiser. It's like this isn't this is weird. We, I don't know about this. Yeah, but it just shows the slow separation of the family now. Because mm -hmm. before you had the dinner scene, all of them sitting at the right table together, yes, together. But now things are splintering. Mm -hmm. and the way that they handled that was was really well done. Really well done, yeah. and yeah, Fenton is is much more mature than than Adam. And a little more, a lot more skeptical. One thing I love that they do is, especially with the Adam character, is, is these are kids. Yeah. And they do kid things. Like Adam comes out, he's like, God sent me a list. <laughs> God sent me a list. It's got my bullies names on it, but God sent this to me. Where'd you get this, Adam? God gave it to me. Isn't Travis Shedd that boy was picking on you at school last week? He's a demon. And yeah. Bill Paxton is like, no, uh, when you're ready, God will send you your own list. I just thought that was a very kid thing to do. <laughs> it's a kid thing to do, which is it's a moment of levity in the film. But yes. It's also really well written because at that point, it shows that Bill Paxton's character, which he's, he's just called dad in the movie. Yeah. He doesn't even really have a name that dad is not completely out of his mind. No. You know, because if his son shows up and says, I got a list too. If this guy was really nuts, he's like, oh good, more demons to destroy. Let's go do it. But no, he's like, now wait a minute. He's like, no. And then he even says them, he even tells them like, no, killing people is wrong. Yes. Getting, destroying demons is right. You can't just make stuff like that up. We destroy demons. If we were to use your list, we wouldn't be destroying demons. We'd be killing people. And we can never do that. The other thing I loved is then later on, later on after that, uh, Fenton and Adam are watching TV and they're watching a, a show on TV and it's a claymation special, whatever. And yes, and uh, and uh, there's like a little boy and his father <laughs> and, and you know like puppets on TV and he's like you know something happened to the boy we know we weren't really sure what happened but he's mm -hmm. upset he's like why did god do this to me and the, you know the father's like god doesn't make you do anything you have your own free will yes. he says you're not a puppet you know no. you, know, you can do whatever you want it's your choice you're not a puppet with strings tied to you no so god doesn't make you do anything he wants you to decide for yourself yeah, God like, doesn't God, tell you God things. Made me, yeah, it's like God made me do it. It's like God doesn't make you do anything. And the kids are just sitting there watching that. And you're like, you know, like, what are they supposed to believe? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, two of my favorite scenes happen around the dinner table. And uh, and that's it. Let me let me preface it with this is I love how it's set in this small, peaceful town it's very, you know, Americana, beautiful streets, kids playing, American flags, all that bullshit. <laughs> but this horrible, horrible thing is happening at this house. It's, it's very Stephen King. And their, their house is literally right behind a rose garden. Rose garden, yes. And yes. not only their house, but the house that used to belong to the caretaker of the rose garden. Yes. So much Stephen King influence in this. <laughs> terrible thing is happening right next to this gorgeous plot of land. And it's very, it's very gothic. And yes. that kind of element really made me love the movie because you seldom see that kind of thing in, 
no it no holds, it just has a great feel to it and and i was i was just all in you know when i saw this but when i first saw the boys coming home and they went through the rose garden mm -hmm. you know you know what kind of movie this is that you're sitting down to watch and you're like a rose garden in a movie like this okay right this is interesting mm -hmm. you know, it's not spooky woods it's not <laughs> like no nope. Not like a decommissioned factory. No, not at all. <laughs> of land with roses everywhere. And you're just like, yes, this, this is very, this is very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. And, and you, you mentioned the word Gothic and it is very Gothic. Um, mm -hmm. It's been uh, described as Texas goth, Gothic, which is interesting, but yeah. going to your point, yes, it, it has a sense of place like the Rose garden things, the house, the dun the shed with the dungeon. And the other thing I really love is Bill Paxton talks, his character talks about God's going to send us three weapons yeah. to fight the demons. And I love how he discovers them, you know, especially the ax and the gloves. Yeah, of course. And it's a great visual, this double-edged ax with Otis scratched into it. And we don't know why. <laughs> we don't know who Otis is. Because he's driving, he's driving, for those who haven't seen it, he's mm -hmm. driving down the highway to, on his way to work because it takes him like an hour to get to work. Mm -hmm. And he's driving and he says that God had called to him on his way to work. And he just like looks off on the side of the street where he's running and he sees this single shaft of light coming out of the clouds mm -hmm. down onto this dilapidated old barn. And you're just like, whoa. And he pulls over and you see him walk into the barn and there in the middle of the barn is a tree stump with the ax in it and then mm -hmm. a pair of gloves sitting right next to it yep and that was another thing that i was like oh because when he talks about the three weapons i'm like a oh, gun sword, uh, knife, right whatever. but it's an axe and not just an axe but an axe with otis carved on yes it, it has character <laughs> yeah and you're like this axe has a name yes somebody named it for no we, we don't know who or why but it, no. it just yeah and that was that was like very impacting and like just cin cinematically was so cool to watch oh yes and, and it's and then you know the gloves he has to hold the, keep the gloves on so that he can handle the people mm -hmm. and he takes the gloves off he touches them and they're revealed to him as demons the angel said when i lay my hands on them i'll reveal them for what they truly are that's what the gloves are for. Then he uses the axe to destroy them. But then one day he comes home with something wrapped in, what is it, like a, like a rag or something. Yeah. On you know, the last one, and he puts it on the table and he unwraps it and it's just a lead pipe. Yeah. You know, and he's like, this is so I can disable them before mm -hmm. I get my hands on them. And we don't know where he found the pipe. <laughs> he, doesn't he doesn't tell that story. <laughs> no, he just, just, he just shows up with it. You'll see. Then you'll believe. Two favorite of my favorite scenes are around the dinner table in this house. The first one is when it's Paxton and Fenton at the table. And like I said before, the especially the Fenton character, it's very adult, the way he talks, the way he reacts to things. His performance is great because yeah. this entire movie kind of lays on his shoulders as far as character and acting. And Paxton is trying to, you know, reassure him, no, this is, this is real. This is what's going on. And Fenton just looks him straight in the face and he's like, maybe you're not right in the head. Maybe, maybe you're not right in the head. It happened, Fenton. It's true. You'll see that soon. And in looking at that scene, knowing what we know, you know, from the end of the movie, and watching Paxton's performance in that scene, it's like he's being he's trying to be a good dad here and he's being extremely sincere. Yeah. And it's it's just amazing yeah, the way that's done. Fenton says the one line that us, the audience watching, is waiting for. Yeah. Stanley says, Dad, maybe you're just crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Bill Paxton very calmly is like, I'm not crazy. Mm -mm. Like, I know what I'm supposed to be doing. This is real, mm -hmm. you know. And of course, that just doubles it up in the audience. Like, well, is he or isn't he? You mm -hmm. know, well, he has to be. 
because does this really happen to people? No, not really. Right? Like, well, he's just crazy. I got the first list. The angel came to him while he was at work. He was at work one day underneath a car. That is such a great scene. <laughs> I know, it's great. He's looking at the underside of the car with the parts and the metal and everything, and then all of a sudden he hears a ring in his ears, and it's just it's just so great. The underside of the car just, like, morphs into this cathedral. Yes. This dark cathedral, and the angel just comes down at him with a flaming sword. And I love the smash cut to, like, a, a wide shot of him laying under the car, and people just walking by, mm -hmm. you know, carrying on with their day. Like nothing's happening. Yeah. <laughs> it's done he, so like, well. Then he rolls out from under the car, takes out his notebook, and he starts writing down a list of names. Yeah. Yeah. And then the first first woman on on his list is the one he brings home, all beaten up and her hands duct taped and whatnot. And he's doing mm -hmm. this right in front of his children. Yeah, it's very and, creepy because he brings and, them both in and he's like, you need to be here. Yeah, that That is the most frightening part is that when he brings her home, puts her down mm -hmm. and then the boys come up with the flashlights and you see blood on the back of his shirt. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, and you're, and you're like sitting there saying, please tell me he just goes in there alone with her. No, you know, but no, he looks right at his kids and he says, come out here. Son, come over here. I need your help. You know, and you're like, no, 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 no. And, and even still, because it's just Fenton. Mm -hmm. Does Fenton come in here, whatever, and then you hear Adam yell, Dad, what's going on? Dad? Come on out here, Adam. Of course, he's like, that's a demon, son. And mm -hmm. it's our job. And he takes off his gloves. And it's close and he grabs her on the arm and then he's like, oh, oh, like he feels it, but we don't see what he's We don't saying. see anything. So we're like, is this real or not? And then he grabs her again for longer and it's just a big, you know, ah. like almost electricity going through. Mm -hmm. And then he lets, lets her go and he's like, he's like, oh, he's like, you don't deserve blah, blah. And he grabs the ax and then it just, he raises it up and then it just zooms in on the boy's faces when you hear the chop. Yes. And both his sons are just like, <laughs> that just like, happened. Oh God. And I love how they do that, like that that pull in shot on Fenton and stuff like that. There's not there's not a lot of gore in this movie. Everything but, happens off screen. Yeah, and it's purposely done. Yeah. And it, I Bill Paxton talked a little bit about it in the interview that I watched. He's like He's like, I believe like the mind's eye can is scarier than, you know, a bunch of blood and stuff on the screen. Whatever you can make up in your head, what you see in your head, you're going to make up something even scarier. Yeah. And I, I agree with that fully. Oh, the other the other di uh, dinner table scene that I love is... Um, well, dad tells Fenton, you know, you can't tell anybody if you like he's yeah. he's been kind of threatening that a little bit, but he hasn't yet. But then it's getting pushed to the point where he's like, there's nothing else I can do. You know, his little, his little brother won't come with him, so he's not going to run away without right. his little brother. So that's like his final option. <clears throat> and he they he makes him go along to get the next victim. He's got his two boys <laughs> in this grocery shopping center parking lot mm -hmm. and this old man toddles out and they kind of set up a ruse to he pretend he has Fenton pretend like their dog is stuck under his car to distract him please Trixie Trixie come on come Trixie Trixie come on what you doing boy Bill Paxton comes up and hits him with the lead pipe and they drag him in the car and so the whole thing Fenton's just bawling and it's it's such a it's very, it's, it can, it's hard to watch sometimes. Help me grab his legs. Help me grab his legs now. Come on. Cause you're and just like, just Jesus so, Christ. And because even like, you know, in the van, like when they first get there is great because they get mm -hmm. there, see him drive up their victim, the old man, he gets out and goes into the store and Fenton's like, what now? And dad's like, well, we wait, 
we gotta wait for him to come out we're not gonna get him in the store yeah they sit there and and they're just you know waiting and adam's in the back and and dad picks up a book which is about holy visions <laughs> that he's reading about <coughs> and he yes. starts reading and they show time passes a little bit and fenton's sitting there and then fenton sees the man come out of the store you know but he looks over like this at his dad and his dad is down in the book mm -hmm. you know, so the dad doesn't see him yet and you can just see what's going through fenton's head like i'm not going to tell him we'll just let this guy go yeah looks back and the guy heads for his car and then fenton looks over like this and looks over and he looks over and bill paxton is looking right at the car and you're like oh, oh. so close so close and then so yeah and then fenton gets out and they do the ruse and everything and it's great because right before they do it fenton looks at dad and says it's brad daylight yeah and like people are gonna see us and he says no god will blind them mm -hmm. god will protect us nobody will see us and nobody does but what if someone sees us they won't it's broad daylight i told you god will blind them for us and finally one night you know his dad has has brought a person home and then they're gonna kill him again and he freaks out and runs away runs to the sheriff's station Sheriff's not in the office. He's in his house behind it. He's going to take off for some fishing weekend. You know, he's, he's ready for his vacation. Yeah. But Fenton is hysterical. And he's like, I will show you. You don't believe me? I'll show you. What are you doing? Calling your dad. You can't. Yes, I can. You ought to be ashamed making up stories like that. But, but it's true. I can show you. They're sitting there at the, the kitchen table, the sheriff and the dad character. And they're having this conversation and it's it's kind of ping-ponging back and forth with the sheriff. You know, is this kid full of shit? Uh, maybe we should just do this to placate the kid so he shuts up. Yeah, and uh, dad is like, he's probably mad at me for punishing him earlier. Exactly, but exactly. Before this, before this happened, he forces Fenton to dig. A gigantic <laughs> hole. And by the sixth day, that hole was as dark and deep as my hatred for Dad's God. Well, you finished it all right. Bet you didn't pray once the whole time, did you? Nope. An eight foot by ten foot hole in the ground that they're going to use as a cellar, and then they move a shack on top of it. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's from now on, they take everything down to the cellar and handle things there. Yes. So then, like, it's in the cellar. I could show you. Mm-hmm. You know? And yeah, and, and I love that part where the sheriff's like, um, let's just be done. You know, let's go check the shed and let's just be done with it. Mm -hmm. And Bill Paxton has this great line. He's like, well, if it has to be done, it has to be done. And then he slowly turns to Fenton. He's like, does it have to be done, kiddo? Like, are you going to really make me do what I have to do if we go out to that shed? I love that. Mm -hmm. Maybe we ought to check the shed just to quiet him down. Well, if it has to be done, it has to be done. What do you think, kiddo? Does it have to be done? It's done so well. Yeah. <laughs> and so they go down to the shed, into the, you know, the big hole, and he doesn't see anything. Yeah. But Fenton's like, I'll take you to the Rose Garden. I'll take, I'll show you the bodies in the Rose Garden. But at, by this point, the sheriff is like, I'm out of here. I'm done. And he's walking up the stairs. And then all of a sudden. He falls back down the stairs. He falls back <laughs> down the stairs. Please. You've got to believe me. <laughs> and Paxton is really, really upset because he had to kill a human, not a demon, an actual human being. Yeah, he says, may God bless you and keep you. Yes. <laughs> and then he, then he kills the man and then he vomits. Afterwards. Yes. Mm -hmm. He didn't do it all with the other people he killed, saying this is such a big difference to him that this, this man he considered an actual good man. Yes. He had to yes. kill to protect his mission. May God welcome you. 
can't keep you. And then they're in the Rose Garden where they bury all the other bodies that they're burying. They're burying the sheriff. And he says, I never killed a man before. You know, and Fenn looks at him and goes, you killed plenty. <laughs> exactly. He throws you know, it right it back. Shows, yeah, and it shows the, the still the dissension between the two of them. I never killed a man before tonight. I've seen you kill plenty. Those were demons. That was a man. Why can't you see that? And that Fenton still thinks his father is just insane. Oh, yeah. You made me commit murder! I didn't make you do anything! You did! You're crazy! <laughs> Dad! Dad, no! Dad, don't! <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's it's bad. So, I mean, he, he makes one more attempt to get his brother to run away. He says all this shit, and his brother tells on him. Tells yeah. the dad, hey, Fenton's trying to get me to run away. He doesn't believe all this shit. So, excuse me. Bill Paxton locks this kid in the cellar where they've killed people for at least two weeks. Pray to God, Please. Fenton. Dad, no. Pray Please. for a vision. Please, no. Only he can help you now. No. Fenton's in there for a couple of days, and then Adam comes out with a glass of water. Mm-hmm. And he says, he says, dad won't let me feed you, but you can have a glass of water a day. He says, put your, put your mouth up to the hole and I'll, I'll give you some. And he's literally giving his, his, his brother water through this knot hole in, in the cellar door. Mm-hmm. He says, do you want me to save She's for later? And he's like, no, more, more, more. He's like, oh, he's like, Adam, you got to help get me out of here. And he goes, well, dad says you'll probably be out by the end of the week. And then he goes, a week? I can't like, stand here a week. Dad says you'll probably be out there by the end of the week. You just have to accept God's will. A week? I can't stay in here that long. I'll pray for you. And then Adam runs off, and then the week happens, and then Matthew McConaughey is telling the story. He says I, he lost track of time. Track of time, yeah. We don't really know how long he was down there. No, we but I, it was probably at least for two weeks, maybe. At then. least. But I love it when Bill Paxton opens up and he's like, Did you see God yet? And the kid looks up to him. He's just like, has no he's just lifeless body oh, yeah. he just looks up and he's like there is no god just like a big fuck you I'm, you know you're not gonna crack me <laughs> has god spoken to you yet there is no god they finally come to check fenton because he's not responding mm-hmm. they go they finally open it up and take him out and then fenton says dad i saw god i was I like I, yeah yeah <laughs> he's in the he says dad you know i never should have not believed you he's Mm-mm. like i see what you're doing now and then, and... it's a new day isn't it fenton mm-hmm. so we're gonna go get the demon now after a while and fenton's ready he even like voluntarily goes and helps his dad take the next victim. Oh yeah, him. he's all into it now. Yeah. You sure you're ready for this? Yes, sir. Back to the cellar, you know, and they're ready to do it. And, and yeah, it's gonna be Fenton's first yeah. kill. I've been waiting for this moment ever since all this started. I'm ready to fulfill my destiny. I'm proud of you, son. Dad, yeah, dad hands the axe to Fenn and says, destroy him. And Fenn rears back, but then he buries the axe in his dad. Yeah. <laughs> dad! Because that's the only thing he could do. Yep. That was, he couldn't run away. He couldn't tell the authorities. That was his last option. But then, so they've got this guy de- slash demon whatever still laying there all taped up mm-hmm. and all of a sudden little adam picks up the axe and rushes him screaming and kills him yeah kills the demon no! yep. oh my gosh so let's let's talk about the ending a little bit um <laughs> the ending to our our wraparound um before we get into a, a couple over overarching things um, yeah, because, yeah uh, they finish up the story and and power power booth um office 
mm-hmm. you know, the FBI building and says, you know, they talk about the God's hand killer and he thinks it's his brother, uh, brother Adam. Mm-hmm. And he says, you know, we, we, we'll, we'll talk about the, the case. And he says, well, we only found one body. After that, we have a note that we wouldn't find any other bodies. And McConaughey says, well, I think I know where those bodies are. The Rose Garden. The Rose He's Garden. Like, well, let's, let's go see. Mm-hmm. So Powers Booth handcuffs Matthew McConaughey and they get into a cop car. Well, he throws Matthew McConaughey the cuffs. Oh, yeah. And, and I like this drive scene. Because it shows that Powers Booth isn't just some sap because he's picking up stuff. He's yeah. not quite making the connections, but he's picking things up. He yeah. knows not to trust this guy, yeah. first of all. But then he's talking about, oh, do you ever think about being a cop? You have great sensibilities for that. And Matthew McConaughey is like, yeah, when I was a kid, you know, kind of brushing it off, but you could tell that Powers Booth is picking up those clues and signals about this guy. He's just not quite making the connection. You are hiding something from me. What is it you think I'm hiding? Well, why don't you just keep talking? Maybe I'll figure that out. And we need to talk about the car driving scene because mm-hmm. It's a feat of filmmaking. It is. They are not really on a highway driving at all. They are literally in a room that's blacked out, Mm -hmm. all lights up and everything. And they are literally spraying water on the windows of the car to make it look like rain. And then they have, they have grips and um, um, we'll say other guys. Other guys. Other guys. They've got. (laughs) hoods on and they've got flashlights just going duct taped together with lights to look like headlights they're just going by the car mm-hmm. up and down like this to make it look like cars passing mm-hmm. and they just move the car like this to make it look like it's moving on the road and everything. oh yeah you could you would have no idea no idea bill butler said oh yeah let's do the old uh, mag flashlight gag and he took two mag flashlights put them on a stick tied them with a piece of black tape and put a guy in all black behind the car as they were filming it. And that guy kind of walked around and, and walked off. And when you see the footage, you totally believe that there's a car behind this. Because it was so cheaply and inventively done. You would you could swear that car is on the highway at night with the car. Oh yeah, behind. old school movie tricks. <laughs> yeah, it's just fascinating to uh, look at the behind the scenes about that scene, especially and how they did it. Because when I first found out, I was like, what? No, and you go back and you watch the scene, you're like, I can't believe that it's so Mm-mm. well done. No, it's really well done. It's literally guys walking around with flashlights in the dark and someone <laughs> spraying water in a car. If the illusion's gonna work the way you designed it or the way you want it to work, everything has to be perfect. The challenge of the scene in the car, of course, was to move many lights and give the illusion that the car itself was moving. And cut, good job, guys. Then the rest of it just falls to the editor. They, they get to the Rose Garden and they're still kind of chit-chatting, stuff like that, because he's, he's leading Powers Booth to where he buried, uh, where he buried Adam. Because yeah. he said before, you know, I promised, you know, I would bury him in the Rose Garden. Tell me more about that promise you made to your brother. So we get there and and then they start talking about this promise. And this is kind of your first clue, kind of the first opening of the door to the first twist. He Mm. tells the story about the promise, but it's Fenton (laughs) having Adam promise to bury him in the Rose Garden. If you ever destroy me, promise me you'll bury me here. Promise to God I'll bury you here. Yeah, and power, Powers Booth is like, like what? <laughs> Wait, what? What are you talking about? And it's just this, this great twist and moment that just happens, and you're like, whoa, because then Matthew McConaughey turns around and he goes, well, it does make sense if the man mm-hmm. in front of you is Adam Meeks. So that's and the first like, twist. What? Yeah, <laughs> and, then you're, and then, of course, Powers Booth gets in and puts his flashlight into Matthew McConaughey's face and then you could like it's almost like how did you not see it because exactly and they show a flashback of little Adam and you're like he's blonde and you know everything it's just like (laughs) duh (laughs) you're like wow yeah and then of course they they walk further into the rose garden he says well he's like this wait a minute 
the God's hand killer only had seven victims. There's more than seven bodies here. He's like, he, he's putting more bodies here. And then McConaughey, truth, McConaughey is like, no. It was like, Adam, he, he kept. Like, kept fan, his, yeah. Fan, he, kept his, he kept his victims in his basement. Mm-hmm. And he looked at him and he said, this is where I put demons. Yes. <laughs> just just real. This is where yeah. I put demons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> what? Fenton didn't bury his victims here. He kept them as trophies in his basement. This is where I put demons. Oh, then, my God. How does he How does he try and assault McConaughey? I can't forget when he finally touches him. Well, he, well, because it starts, he, he starts talking about his mom because we get that at, when he first meets McConaughey, right. when he's sitting in his office, he's holding a picture that was on Powers, Powers Booth's desk of Powers Booth and his mother. Yeah. He's studying that picture when Powers Booth walks in and he asks him a little bit about it here and there, yeah. you know, and at the end, he really lays it on, you know your mother's dead no one ever found her killer blah 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 and i got to you maybe that's not gonna bring your mother back is it she's dead and her killer got away didn't he and i think he just kind of lunges at him right and he grabs him by the wrist and you get that initial which is the first time they've ever touched. Yes. He doesn't shake his hand when they walk in. Because when they walk in, he goes, Power Booth goes to shake his hand and Matthew kind of hands him the picture he's looking yes. at. Yes. And then he goes to put the handcuffs on and he tosses them. Mm-hmm. He puts it on self. And then when they're going to get into the car, and Powers Booth goes to put Matthew McConaughey in the back seat to push his head down. It's like, no. Nope. He goes, I got it. I got it. So don't touch course, me <laughs> yeah if mcconaughey can feel people and reveal them as demons which mm-hmm. he can really do yes <laughs> all, all of this was true yes the get-go because like back when they were kids you know fenton's like how can you believe this adam the dad's doing and adam says no i believe it i see it when he touches him yes and, and he it, does he did because his dad was literally chosen by god to do this yes we get all those flashbacks of the the, tu- the laying of hands yeah. and adam saw all those visions of them killing people and doing horrible things the the one old guy that they got from the yeah. grocery yeah. shopping center parking lot was like a child killer and yeah. molester just really really terrible terrible people yeah. really and then, terrible and then he grabs powers booth and he gets a flashback of powers booth killing his own mother with a knife yes yes and powers booth says how did you know about that and mcconaughey says you were on my list you were on my list <laughs> then the the, a hole that he already had dug waiting for him. Oh, yeah. And grabs Otis. He's still using the, the three tools. The whole going in and confessing thing was just a huge plan to get his demon, the FBI agent, out there so he could bury him in the Rose Garden with everybody else. They'll keep looking for Fenton. You're going to be his last victim. And then he says, well, I'm, people have seen you. People have looked at you. They know what you look like. And McConaughey stands there holding the X and he just says, God will protect me. God will protect me. And he does. And yeah, he just brings down the ax on Powers Booth and that's it. And then the next yep. day is great. Oh, yeah. Wesley Dodd, the FBI <laughs> agent is missing. and They're all looking for him. And they're talking about the guy who was in there. And the agent who met him is like, look, it's just a blur. I told you. I yeah. This guy. I shook his hand. I have no idea what it looks like. I can't explain it. Look, I told you it's just a blur. I can't understand that I looked right at him. I shook his hand. Mm-mm. And one guy comes over. He says, well, we got him on tape. Don't worry. They put the tape in this. Just this all this. fuzzed out. Yeah, they say, there it is. And it's literally fuzzed like this. Right, right over his face. And that's right it. <laughs> just like, <laughs> it's so crazy. It's so crazy. Well, the first twist is, it's not Fenton, it's Adam. Adam. Second twist is he set this whole thing up just to get to kill mm-hmm. the FBI because he was a demon mm-hmm. and carrying on the family business. Yep. The third one is he was really is an agent of God because yes. he is being 
exactly. Humans, and he is being protected by God. And then there's another twist. <laughs> <laughs> when when the 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 lesser agent who first welcomed McConaughey in goes to the hometown mm-hmm. to see the sheriff to talk about Fenton and Adam and the family and everything. Yep. And he walks in, he says, Is the sheriff here? And she, the girl behind the counter who's pregnant, by the way, mm-hmm. says, Oh yeah, sh- sheriff, you here? And he walks out in sheriff's clothes. Matthew McConaughey. Because <laughs> they they because Powers Booth called that sheriff station earlier in the movie to check out his story. Oh. And the girl who's pregnant, who's Matthew McConaughey's wife, it's later revealed, is like, oh, what's he done now? He's stolen an ambulance and his brother's body. She was, you know, she was part of it. She was in on it. Yep. <laughs> yeah, he says, oh. Well, we're gonna wrap stuff up and it's got bad news about your brother Fenton. Yep. <laughs> you know, he's a serial killer. We found bodies in his basement and he probably killed an FBI agent. Probably. And, that, and then they go outside onto the street and they're, you know, well, and McConaughey is like, well, anything I can do from here on, you just let me in, let me know, I'll take care of it, whatever. And they go, thank mm-hmm. you. And the shakes his hand. FBI agent puts his hand out. I think McConaughey shakes it. You're a good man, Agent O. <laughs> it's such Let's a great go. ending. <laughs> such a great ending. Yep. Oh my gosh. And I mean, there's there's a few like Old Testament parables and stuff to this film. I mean, you have Abraham and Isaac, you know, where God asked him to sacrifice his son because God tells Bill Paxton, your son is a demon. Only demons should fear me. And you're not a demon, are you? The angel said you were. Benton is a demon. Yeah. Benton is a demon. You need to kill him. And he's like, trying to figure out a way to not have to do that. No, I'll throw him in the hole and I'll make him see God. I'll make him turn around. I can change him, whatever. Which, which ironically, is probably what turns Fenton into a demon in the first Exactly, place. Because yes. of the abuse he suffered at the hand of his father and seeing mm-hmm. him murdered is what twists him. Exactly. So you're like, it's a very interesting kind of circle mentality there because you're like, mm-hmm. well, is he, was he a demon from birth? Or was he turned into a demon by the work of God, essentially? Exactly. And you're like, how does this play against each other? And it's just very interesting to think about. It's very interesting. It's very interesting. And it had been a a few years since I had watched the movie. And watching it this time, because, you know, you know beforehand when you go in for a rewatch, you know how it ends. So watching the movie with that in mind, it gives you a little bit different perspective on it, or it can, because you're, I mean, one, Matthew McConaughey could be an unreliable narrator. That's possible. That's possible. But he's telling the story from the demon's perspective. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. And that just kind of turns everything just a little bit more. How much of it is actually true? Mm-hmm. How much of it did he embellish here and there? What did he make up? What did he mm-hmm. reflect with the truth with half truths? Oh, so yeah. the whole time you're like, this is a story, but when everything happens at the end, you're like, what was the actual story? Yeah. Which we'll never really know. No, not at all. So, and I mean, I th- I think most of it is is probably true because I mean he has no reason to lie about it because he knows he's gonna kill Powers Booth anyways. But it's it's still really fun to think about. Yeah. Um, and also, I love movies where nothing is telegraphed hugely in this movie. Mm. It's like, I I don't think anyone going into this and into this film and, and, you know, not having seen it before, not having heard of it before, would ever be able to guess where it's going. It it really takes the audience on a ride and trying to figure out this mystery. Well, being, being, this is what I always talk about, being a screenwriter myself, Mm -hmm. 
I, I mean, I have a writer's brain. Mm-hmm. I go in and see, like, there are movies I've gone and seen and I've figured out by, like, oh, yeah. Or, you know, this time I figured out from the trailer. I'm like, oh, I know how that one ends. <laughs> yeah, I know where this is going, blah, blah, blah. Because, like, you know, speaking, writing, creatively writing-wise, be like, if I was writing, this is what would have happened. And oh, like, yeah. Oh, this, that's right. Yep. But I know I'm in for a good movie if I'm sitting there watching it. I'm, like, halfway through and I cannot see the ending. If I cannot see what's yep. coming which is either a very good sign or a very bad sign. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I could really be thrown for a really fun loop. Like with this movie, Frailty, mm-hmm. I could be essentially really let down with a crappy ending. Oh, yeah. But this one, I was I was like, yeah, I told everybody with an earshot about it for years after. Yeah. So. No, it blew, it, it blew me away because going into it, I didn't expect... The movie that I got, I was expecting just some axe murdering slasherish horror movie, and that's not what this is <laughs> at all. No, I mean it's 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 great because they horror movies. I mean, you know, there are good and bad movies everywhere, and bad horror movies are all about the horror. Yes, the torture, the pain, the the blood and stuff like that. I mean, that stuff is all. It's great. Fun. Oh yeah, Great. but if that's what your movie is all about, it's going to sink. Mm-hmm. When you, when that is all in the background, and you put a, a more firmer, um, relatable theme for it, like this, the theme in this is family. Oh yeah, and that's and right. most people can relate to that. Yeah, and it's about inner the dynamics of the family, how it stays together, how it falls apart, people turning on each other, especially in religious extremism. Mm-hmm. Of course, you put all that in the fourth right to make it really. A lot more interesting and put everything mm-hmm. else is like window dressing around it then you've got a great fucking movie oh yeah and these characters are so well written they're so oh, well yeah. written yeah and a lot of times child actors can just be really annoying <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean yeah but these two especially the kid that played fenton was was so good and weren't they weren't they both local from like texas I think so. They, they, they wanted, he wanted like Texas boys, but he also want, he didn't want um, like showbiz kids. Right. Yeah. Because the material was so a little more lofty than what kids usually are doing in a film, you know, and especially the character of Fenton, because the audience needs to be on board with that character or it falls apart. We we need to be on board with that character. And the way it's written and the way they establish that relationship at the beginning and and how he pushes back at his father just mm-hmm. completely sells that story to the audience because you're you're sitting there the whole time thinking who am i supposed to believe who am i supposed to yeah believe? you automatically want to root for the children of course yes but when you've got bill paxton playing a character that is so i'm right Yes. The whole time without without wavering. Oh no, and it's not abusive at all. It's oh, not no. it's not abusive, especially in his own head. I mean, he throws his kid in a hole for a couple of weeks. <laughs> but he he's still trying to be their dad. Yeah. Yeah, he's 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 recruiting them for a family business as well. Exactly. <laughs> but <laughs> not a uh, well, I guess technically a good business as it turns yeah. out. You're working for God. Yeah, right. <laughs> God's will has been served. Did Did Paxton direct anything else? No. After this, I didn't think so. Is, this is literally the only thing he directed. <laughs> But he did such a good job. There's so many uh, transitions in this movie that I love. Mm. One of my favorite ones is um, when uh, Powers Booth and Matthew McConaughey get to the Rose Garden and they have that first walk in and then it goes down to that statue Mm. and then it comes back up and we've jumped time back to the two kids all in one shot all in one shot it's so good it's so good and it's it's these 
more old school filmmaking techniques that he used. Yeah. That just make it that more intimate and real and engaging. Yeah. Yeah. They used a lot of in-camera techniques and stuff with this, which has also made it really attractive you know, mm -hmm. to, to, um, to an audience because you don't, you really don't see that much of that anymore these days. No, you don't. <laughs> Get out of here, butthole! Well, is there anything else you would like you like to mention before we sign off about frailty? About frailty? Uh, it's awesome. See it. <laughs> don't, don't just see it, buy it. Yeah, buy it. It's on. It's streaming on HBO Max, but you should yeah. get a copy of it for yourself. Yeah, the Blu-ray is great. It really came out great. I mean, even the everything about even the opening credits of this thing. Yes. Are like because it just they're very slow creep crawl, and they're just framed with all these mm -hmm. like nineteen thirties, nineteen forties crime scene photos and news articles, and then they put in you know, like the God's Hand case mm -hmm. news articles. It's very 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 old school and creepy and very oh yeah well because bill paxton says in the movie he's like you know it's not just us there's other there are other there people. Are other people that have been tasked with this nobody knows it except us and others like us which yeah. would be a really interesting thing if they they did like a spiritual sequel they, where they follow another person that's been tasked with this that was another thing when i first watched it for time when he said i remember him saying that and then mm -hmm. part of me actually wondered like like i said like halfway through i'm like how is this going to end part of me was wondering if they were actually going to run into another family ah and with the theme of family i thought maybe they would like join, join together them. yeah and I, th I thought it would be really cool if the other family was led by a single mom mm -hmm. You know, that's the way and, we became the Brady Demon Killer Bunch. <laughs> bloody Brady Bunch. The Bloody Brady Bunch. <laughs> bloody Benders Bunch. Well, uh, now, now I'm curious. I, I'm looking something up. Hang on. Mm -hmm. Okay, no. Uh, did you ever see One False Move with Bill Paxton? Oh, it's been a while. Okay, well, you need to see it again. It's great. I, I couldn't remember if he directed that or not but he did okay okay yeah i suddenly was like wait a minute didn't he direct one other thing but no he did uh i wish he would have rest in peace bill paxton like charles lawton in night of the hunter yes like the one movie he directed and it was amazing amazing like, oh and of course just like bill paxton charles lawton was like nope never again because all the studio crap breathing down my neck and everything uh. Just like, oh, imagine if they just would have backed off and let him make I like know. 60 more movies. It would have been fantastic. Oh. Just like the Paxton, apparently. Yeah, and and not just because of his directing or, or what he does or his acting. He has an eye for interesting stories, it yeah. seems. Well, just with what he's, his, the projects he's picked for himself, especially yeah. the more independent stuff. And then, you know, finding this script and, and taking it on. He, he was killed by an alien, a predator, and a, and a Terminator. Terminator. <laughs> it's fucking great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that, <laughs> you can't beat that. That's no, that's Park. all you have to have on your resume. <laughs> No, this is this is great to talk about this movie because I've loved this movie ever since it came out and I haven't had a chance to talk about it with anyone yet. And I'm so glad it was you because I knew how much you would appreciate it uh, and, and really dig into it and the themes and the writing. Um, fantastic. So where can people find you? They can find me actually a, a lot of places now. <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on uh, Instagram. And I've, my book is still out there, Monster Box, which is a book of short horror stories, which mm -hmm. is slowly gaining gaining speed, and uh, which is cool. And I have I have always have copies in like local bookstores around here, and they've actually been selling out recently. Nice. Cool. And a bit actually, my biggest news is is that one of the screenplays I just finished that I've been working on for a while that I'm really proud of 
I actually got funding for nice. and I'm going to be directing it next year. Oh, that's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. So it'll be my directorial debut. And I'm oh, very, that's so cool. Very, uh, very pumped. So, and we're going to, I mean, we're already starting, we're getting casting locked down and everything, and then we're going to get rolling on it. So very cool. Can't wait. <laughs> Just got to do like 75 more drafts of the script to please. Oh, of course. <laughs> Well, well, for me too, because I want it to be, you know, when I want it to be before we start, so. No, that's that's really, really cool. I'll make sure everyone knows, like, the process on that when it comes out and everything. But thank you so much, again, for for gracing the channel with your presence. It's well, always it's a treat. Time. This is always a great time with you talking <laughs> about flicks and whatnot. Just, yeah, anytime you got more time, want to talk about something else, let me know. I'll be here. Awesome. Awesome. Well, and thank you everyone for joining us on this uh, very special Halloween episode of I Love This Movie. Take care. May God welcome you and keep you.